Okay, I think we're going to start. Welcome uh, to this uh, Cambridge Socio Legal Group uh, webinar, although it is both in person and online. So, welcome to those of you who are in the room and to a number of you who have joined via Zoom. Um, my name is uh, Richard Heaton. I'm the Warden of Robinson College. Um, and just to declare an interest, I'm also a former civil servant, former colleague of uh, uh, at least two members of the panel, and a former government lawyer as well. But I'm here just to introduce proceedings. We're going to spend this uh, seminar looking at two major professional inputs into the policy making process, uh, with particular reference to the COVID pandemic. Um, and we're going to do it in two parts. For the first part, uh, it's a double act presentation from Peter Fish and John Aston. Um, Peter, former colleague of mine, uh, is a distinguished government lawyer, or uh, ex-government lawyer, uh, was amongst other things the head lawyer at the Attorney General's office and at the Home Office, and more recently was Deputy Treasury Sister and indeed Acting Treasury Sister after Jonathan Jones's resignation. Um, John Aston uh, is a Professor of Statistics here in Cambridge, or Harding Professor of Statistics in Public Life, Distinguished Scientist, Analyst and Statistician, and has also done time in government as the Chief Scientific Advisor and Head of the Analytical Function also at the Home Office. And then when we have the double act, um, Dr. Leah Trueblood um, uh, will uh, reflect on what she's heard, uh, will discuss it, I think is the um, academic term, and maybe, maybe raise some questions on the back of it. After that, if we've got time, we have a hard finish at two, so there won't be much time. Uh, we will take questions both from the room and online via Dr. Sloan, who is uh, engaged in Zoom, which I'm not right at the moment. A um, couple of housekeeping points, uh, so get your questions ready, but a couple of housekeeping points. The first half of this, as to say the presentations and the discussion to piece, are sort of public and shareable. Uh, we will then, and will be recorded. Uh, we will not be recording the Q&A, so for both the, those of you in the room and remotely, please, the terms of engagement are the second half is Chatham House, please, and is not attributable, and that will encourage a more open conversation. So with that, um, over to Peter and John to do the, uh, the double act. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, it's, it's a real delight to be able to do this today. Um, I've uh, sort of come back to Cambridge and been really thinking a little bit about what we did with science advice and really sort of felt that there's a, a massive interaction, not only with science advice, but all sorts of other professional advice, actually not least uh, legal advice. And so the opportunity to actually talk about it jointly was something that's been uh, really fun. So I'd like to thank Brian and others for uh, inviting us to do this. So um, I'm going to start off with science, um, and I don't think science has ever been more prominent in government. Um, uh, you'll have probably seen the uh, Downing Street briefings. Um, for those of you who can see the slide, uh, Chris Whitty on the, uh, uh, on, in the corner there, um, talking to some uh, statistics, talking to some uh, spatial maps uh, of data. And then you've got the coronavirus dashboard, which uh, numerous people across the country have been looking at to find out what's happening with uh, COVID cases, uh, deaths, uh, numbers of people in hospital, uh, vaccines. And so really science has become sort of integral to government in a way that probably we haven't seen for uh, at least since the, the Second World War. So really sort of interesting time for science and its relationship with government. Thanks, and just to um, say thank you again to John for uh, inviting me, delighted to be here. Um, the same with law. I mean, law has always been integral to government. The legislative programme, uh, in, uh, which is set out by government in the Queen's speech at the beginning of its sessions, has always been a kind of indication of the direction of travel of, of particular governments. And its ability to get legislation through has been a sort of mark of its achievements and its success. So that obviously has been really integral to government. I think people have got to know some of the sort of integral intricacies of the uh, constitutional position through Brexit and the legislation and the litigation around prorogation. We've got a picture of Baroness Hale and the litigation on that. So that's an area of law which really suddenly came into public consciousness, which perhaps wasn't there before. And then with COVID, we've had so much law which has really affected our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I think unlike scientists, we saw um, you know, the chief scientists there, Government lawyers have been very much in the background. So again, it's the reason why you've got Baroness Hale there rather than Susanna McGibbon, who's a Treasury Solicitor, or Richard Heaton, who uh, used to be the legal, Chief Parliamentary Counsel. So very much in the background, but an integral part of, um, making, of making government work. So I'm gonna say a little bit about what government lawyers do, a little bit about um, where they are, where they sit, just for a few minutes, then I'll hand over to John, who's gonna sort of do the same for science, and then we'll bring it together into the policy making. So there are about 
two and a half um, thousand, between 2,000 to 2,500 government lawyers and, uh, lawyers and central government. They are civil servants, so they're employed as civil servants. And um, so that means they are bound by the civil service code as well as their own professional obligations. Um, yeah, as with all civil servants, they're there to support the government of the day in delivering their policy and operational objectives. So it's very much embedded in departments working with policy, operational colleagues, expert advisors in supporting the government of the day, delivering its own policies and approaches. And advising early, I think the point that I think both of us would like to get across is that in working out policies, both lawyers and in good policy making, it doesn't always happen, but lawyers and scientists are involved right at the outset in brainstorming issues, looking at what the problems are, looking at how to solve them, and through to legislation and through to implementation. So there's a lot of expert advice going on right throughout government, uh, which isn't necessarily seen. I think most of what government lawyers do is not visible. Um, just to say a little bit about um, the role in legislation. Um, legislation is drafted by government lawyers. There are specialist lawyers, about 50 specialist lawyers in the Parliamentary Council who draft all primary legislation. Richard used to be head of the Parliamentary Council's office. Uh, the rest of the legislation is drafted by government lawyers in departments or in the centre. And to give a flavour of that, there's about 32 bills in a single year, in a, in a normal year, somewhere between 30, 35 acts of primary legislation. There's 1,300 act, uh, pieces of secondary legislation, such instruments, which are drafted by government lawyers right across government, slightly more during the Brexit and COVID times, but, but around that. So all that legislation going on uh, being drafted. Um, so, that, so that's one of the primary functions. Of course, um, government is often challenged. So there's, a, there's a, the parts of government lawyers who then defend litigation against government. And there's something like 10,000 judicial reviews every year. 82% of those are around immigration asylum. So that's sort of home office focus. But 10,000 JRs dealt with by government lawyers um, yeah, is a lot. So you know, we see some of that, we see the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot of that litigation going on. Um, and then finally, just to say something about external resources. Um, obviously government lawyers work very closely with academic lawyers but in particular with the private bar and with the private solicitors profession. So we have a panel of um, counsel called the Attorney General's Panel of Counsel who are instructed to represent, to give expert advice. Um, it, there's, a, there's a sort of process for that. So it's a, it's a sort of fair process for that at very favorable rates, frankly, compared to the uh, private sector. And there's um, also a panel of sisters firms traditionally to do this sort of commercial work, uh, but increasingly things like international trade, Things like rail um, and actually overspill as work gets um, busier. So, so, so we work quite closely with um, private sector as well. Then where are we? Well, the, every department has a government legal advisor, civil servant legal advisor, um, uh, and they have a, a team embedded. Now the size of the team sort of varies depending on the nature of the work. So the cabinet office might have something like 30 lawyers, home office had about 90, uh, DFT had about 120, so the, these lawyers are embedded in the departments with a legal advisor working on the legislation and the policy and operational challenges for those departments. About five to 10 years ago, um, there was a move to bring into a single department all the government lawyers uh, in, into what was then the Treasury Solicitors Department and is now called the Government Legal Department. Um, so essentially the Government Legal Department now comprises all of central government lawyers, um, except for two departments, which is the Foreign, and Commerce, uh, Foreign FCDO and the HMRC. So within GLD, there's all these specialist advisory teams, so they're employed by GLD, but embedded and working closely with those departments. Uh, there are specialist teams doing litigation, commercial and employment, all in the treasury system. Just a word about uh, two other government uh, areas of government. Uh, Parliamentary Council, as I mentioned, drafts all of the primary legislation that there are, there are about 50 government lawyers based in the cabinet office. And then just a word about the law officers. I'm sure people I mean, you could write, I'm sure well, books have been written about the law officers and the role of the Attorney General. Um, I mean, essentially, the, the Attorney General is the chief political legal advisor to governments. The Attorney is a minister. Um, the Attorney um, does provide legal advice on um, key sensitive issues of cross-cutting policy and really sensitive policy. But the vast majority of legal advice given to government doesn't, isn't seen by the Attorney, isn't vetted by the Attorney. It's done by government lawyers in their departments. The Attorney has a... Um, a separate function, uh, both in terms of legal advisor, but also overseeing the independent prosecutors, the CPS and um, the SFO, and some public interest functions. But for government lawyers and ministers, the attorney's role is really one of support, escalation of some of the most tricky and difficult issues for definitive advice on those most difficult political uh, issues. 
but not someone who necessarily sees all of the advice and all the work going on in government. So I'll leave it there, hand over to Sean. Well, I mean, science in some ways uh, has quite similar setups um, to, to the legal side, uh, but also, uh, you know, has a slightly different role within them. So I'm going to treat science here as covering a multitude of areas. Um, normally, we think of science as physical sciences, biological sciences, potentially even computational sciences in, in the new world of AI. But actual fact, when I was CSA, um, basically, I, was, I felt that I had a responsibility to think about science across the board, including uh, social sciences, and also um, you know, in, in relation to academics, uh, arts and humanities as well. And really trying to get that uh, academic and scientific uh, expertise into government uh, is, is sort of the role of a CSA, and I'll come on to that in a second. But um, most science, in actual fact, in, that comes into government is carried out by scientists in departments. So um, if you look at the Ministry of Defence, they have a, a very, very large number of scientists, many of them based at the STL. Um, in, in the Home Office, there were scientists who uh, looked after, for example, the um, animals and use of animals and science, the regulation there, worrying about the uh, impacts of uh, science uh, use in technology, in policing and in immigration system, national security. So lots of science was carried out by scientists in government. There was also, of course, lots of scientists outside government who advised government as well, but there is most science carried out by departments is done by scientists within the departments. Um, if you think about science as a sort of where science fits within government, well, if you're talking about science around the role of universities and other things, that's mainly carried out in Bayes, who has the sort of overall responsibility for science policy. Um, yet we have um, uh, lots of exceptions to that. So, for example, uh, if you're thinking about teaching of science, that would be in the Department of Education, or if you're talking about migration of scientists, that would be a home office responsibility. Now, uh, as Peter said, the sort of the normal process uh, of policy making gets science and legal advice and economic advice all into the policy making process at the beginning. But that's variable, and particularly with certain expertise, certain certain areas such as drugs policy and what the effects of particular drugs are, that's always going to have to have a scientific input. But there are other areas where you could imagine more social policy, and the Home Office was a very much a social policy department. The sort of role of science was, you know, could be seen as a bit more uh, a sort of bit harder to sort of work out the exact role of hard science within those areas. But I think during COVID-19, we saw a complete change to that. So almost all the decisions needed some kind of science advice around what happened. I mean, all of us in our daily lives have seen what's happened in universities and other places, and all the sort of um, uh, measures that have been taken require some understanding of the science to understand what the implications of the decisions being made were. Um, lots of focus during COVID-19 on the science being up front, um, and the SAGE mechanism, uh, which you'll have all heard of, um, became key and it changed its role. SAGE was designed as a uh, short-term science advice in emergencies. SAGE has been now going on for a long time. There is, I think, nearly on COVID, uh, the um, up to almost 100 SAGE meetings. Uh, so very different from a few SAGE meetings on a particular topic. On COVID, SAGE became a much longer-term uh, committee. Um, and there was also lots of science advice to government from outside. Normally, uh, science advice in government was a sort of relatively uh, sort of quietly done uh, thing, wasn't particularly public, but suddenly there was huge amounts of expert commentary on what so government should be doing with the science uh, in order to, to determine what their policy should be. Now, I suspect that, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, nobody in this room would have been able to tell me who that person was, but I think almost funny out everybody can tell me that that's Patrick Vallance and who's the, the government chief scientific advisor. So, his role, if you want to think about it, is the, um, the, the chief scientific advisor to the prime minister. Um, but almost every other department has a chief scientific advisor of their own. So I, um, until recently, was doing it in the Home Office. But there are ones for pretty much every uh, government department. And so what's the role of a CSA? Well, it's sort of to try and mesh that independent outside scientific expertise with um, those inside government as well. So CSAs are responsible for giving sort of independent scientific advice uh, to the Secretary of State, to ministers and to senior officials. Um, they're responsible for letting people outside of government know what science is uh, important to government through the areas of research interest. So that really helps people understand in an academic setting, what if I do this particular type of research, what kind of impact could that have in relation to government? Or well, government cares about this or government hasn't mentioned that, so therefore it's probably going to have less impact. Um, in most departments, it's the head of profession for science, so really trying to understand how to make um, the, the role of a scientist more prominent and also the continued um, development of those scientists within departments. Um, but I think one of the key things about being 
a CSA in government is that you're part of the CSA network. So all the chief scientific advisors. So not only was I a scientist in government, but I was also a statistician in government. So therefore, in actual fact, if other departments had statistical problems that they needed some expert outside independent advice, I could come and help those departments as a statistician. And likewise, if we had a particular issue in the Home Office, we could borrow CSAs from other places to be able to look and give their advice on those particular issues within the, um, within, um, uh, within the Home Office. Now, um, in actual fact, that gives us access to a very, very wide range of people with very, very wide expertise. And there's a very, very sort of, um, uh, from physicists and chemists all the way through to um, computer scientists, engineers, architects, who are all CSAs. Uh, in different forms in government. But I think the most important thing about being a CSA is that it's about translation. Most of my time was spent trying to tell people about science or tell ministers about the science that was going to help inform their policies or vice versa, take from the policies that ministers were interested in and turn those into relevant scientific questions that then people could address in their science to actually help inform uh, the policy making process. So thanks. So we really want to focus on making policy um, and actually, what I thought would be helpful is to look back at, well, yeah, is there a model, is there a standard model for, for making policy? I don't think there is, but I think, so my perception or my perspective is that traditionally, um, policies are departmentally led. So essentially, the legal powers and duties lie with Secretary of State. I mean, the, the public generally think, you know, the Prime Minister has powers, the Cabinet has powers. Actually, those powers lie with the Secretary of State, and they're exercised through their departments. They're the ones who sign the the statutory instruments, they're the ones whose decisions are challenged in the courts, they're the ones who have to have the audit trail to defend those decisions. So this sort of, this feeling that you know, uh, how you develop policy, the expertise, the areas of expertise are in the departments. Um, and I think it follows from those, those, those legal and, and um, powers and duties. I think it'll be interesting to see, and we'll come on to talk about that, how that has developed in the crisis mode and in relation to some of these really cross-cutting issues and climate change like COVID, which really bring in every department where you can't make policy in a single department. And I think a question for us, and I'm sure Leah will, and others will come on and talk about it, is do our processes support that policy making in these sort of really complex issues? Um, so the usual way, you would have a department, you would have manifesto commitments, but the department would be working up with its own civil servants, with its own advisors, those policy areas. It would, of course, it would need collective agreement. So it would write round, it would go to a collective agreement at a uh, cabinet committee, there'd be a discussion at cabinet committee, and there would be signed off to introduce legislation. Um, but that, but it would be led from departments. And I think certainly in my experience, that's where how crises have been managed in the past before. So if you have a terrorist incident, it will be the Home Office of the Secretary of State who will lead that out, supported by the cabinet office um, processes, sort of like COBRA and the Civil Contingency Secretariat in the cabinet office but really leading that response. The same if it's foot and mouth, it would be DEFRA minister. Again, COVID challenged that, uh, well, Brexit and COVID have both challenged that way of doing things. I think, again, my personal perspective is there has been a sort of push to centralize uh, in, most, in recent years. I don't think it's necessarily new. I think if you look back at say Tony Blair and others, getting implementation units in number 10, getting policy units number 10 to try and drive delivery uh, from the center rather than just laying pump obviously their own thing there, the, you know, it's not new there's been a history of that um, and you can see why there's political responsibility in the center but the levers potentially lie elsewhere other than sacking the ministers and getting someone else in so so there's this drive for centralization on on the policy um, and implementation and certainly that has with the current government there's a very strong sense of that with policy developed in the center not just just in departments i think there's a civil service reform agenda functional agenda getting expertise uh, improving the expertise of, of professions within government. So lawyers, accountants, statisticians, economists, scientists, and, and, and having some centralization, some head of profession at the center, as John's referred. So that sort of drives towards this more centralized approach. I think Brexit has had a really big impact. Um, so the cabinet committee's structure really focused on the, sing on the single issue of Brexit in, in some respects and had two committees, it had a XS, which is a strategy committee chaired by the Prime Minister, an XO, which was an operations committee chaired by uh, Michael Gove. XO had three permanent members, members, XS had four permanent members, a small group of ministers. They would invite other ministers as appropriate, but actually that, that driving of both the policy and the operations, making decisions on a daily basis, XS, XO was meeting three times a week at, at, the, at the height of uh, 
height of things, making decisions and taking those back in departments, I think is moves the center of gravity to the center. It'd be interesting to see how that plays out. And obviously, uh, management of SPADs, I mean, that was politically, that was very prominent uh, around Dominic Cummings and the management of uh, departmental SPADs through the center. I mean, my sense that sort of disappeared as an issue, but that, that was a sign of the direction of travel, I think, uh, some time ago. But John, I mean, you'll want to say a bit about sort of the science in all this. So I think, I think in some sense that centralization has been very clear in COVID in the sense that um, if you think about what SAGE is as a committee, so SAGE is made up of some uh, government scientists, uh, it's chaired by um, the government chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer, but it has many, many independent uh, uh, members or participants. It doesn't actually have members. It has people who come and participate in SAGE. And that was a central committee. SAGE traditionally has always reported through into COBRA, but it's a centralized uh, way of doing things. Whereas, as I talked about a, a, a little while ago, um, in actual fact, lots of the science is actually being done in departments. So there's that sort of tension there between the centralized, what SAGE is saying around the pandemic versus the science that is being done to support the decisions of the departments. And if you can think about it, in actual fact, Secretaries of State, ministers have to make many, many, many decisions, many of which are relatively small and routine. But if they're now having to have science advice, they can't simply ask all those questions to SAGE. That doesn't work as a centralized system. So therefore, it's a very much about getting the departments to work out what the macro level SAGE advice is and then using that to understand how to implement those through the science advice that's happening within, uh, within departments. So there is absolutely this sort of uh, uh, difference between what's happening at the center, the sort of very visible SAGE process mechanism of science advice versus what's actually happening in departments where the decisions themselves are being made on a routine basis. Um, so we thought we'd sort of mention a few issues arising COVID sort of which put some of this under, under, well, under pressure, but also sort of raise some issues, which I think be interesting to see how those play forward. I mean, from a legal perspective, you know, big, some real big issues, what powers do you use to, to, um, to implement the policies which are in place? You know, the primary legislation, the secondary legislation, civil contingencies act. Um, and there's been like the constitution committee has done a really interesting uh, report on this and the Hansard uh, committee has done a, an interesting trawl of, of the legislation. And in fact, you know, there are two, main bits of primary legislation there's the um there's the covid act itself which was introduced but there's the public health act which dates back to 1984 under which most of the really substantive uh, bits of legislation were were made uh, about 125 pieces of legislation all the lockdown measures were made under public health legislation by secondary legislation not uh, not in primary legislation the the, the um the covid act uh coronavirus act powers have only been used a handful of times, about 20 times, whereas actually all these other powers are under the Public Health Act. Um, and the Civil Contingency Act wasn't used. I mean, you might think a crisis like this, isn't this the, the, isn't this the time for the Civil Contingency Act and, and the processes that, and the sort of exclusionary involved in that? I mean, there was a choice um, and other powers are used. And again, the Constitution Committee looks at that and others have sort of talked about that. But I think it, it, it's interesting, the, the sort of the agility the need for quick decisions and how those uh, how those how that association was made, but one of the biggest impacts, sort of for for us, and I think visibly, is that the, the health legislation is devolved. So inevitably, the UK government is making legislation for England, and the you know, the devolved administrations are making their legislation for them in relation to what is essentially a national crisis. So that both has played out visibly and publicly in relation to Prime Minister's announcements some conflation and confusion about, well, are these measures UK measures or are they for England? Most of these measures that under the, the um, Public Health Act are, are simply applying to England. So that's, again, it's actually put the devolution um, position quite in the spotlight. The other thing from um, sort of legislation perspective was the question of guidance and legislation. How much do you uh, set out clear rules in legislation, how much do you advise you put in guidance? And that, again, the Constitution Committee has looked at that, and that has implications, which we'll talk about in a minute, for legality, really, how, you know, how clear are you on what your obligations are and how, uh, yeah, how, how clear are those? Do you, want to, do you want to say anything on that, or should I move on? No, what do you mean? So, so the other thing is, well, who is the decision maker? We I sort of touched on this before. I mean, we assume government makes decisions, and it, and it does, and it has collective decisions, and we've talked about the committee structures in place. But those 100, 125 pieces of secondary legislation, which initiated all the lockdowns, all the, all the tiers, all the social distancing, were made by the Secretary of State for Health under his powers. And actually the legislation required him to form a judgment on whether that legislation was necessary. So essentially, although there's this process, it's actually the Secretary of State for Health who is making that decision. And he was the one who was challenged in 
case of Dolan and all the others, he, he was a defendant in that case. So you need to, although there's this massive collective decision making, you need the decision maker to have the tools and the information and the data to both make the appropriate decision and then to defend that decision and have the audit trail for how that decision is made. Um, so, so again, you know, as a, from the legal perspective, politically is the government's decision, actually legally, it's a sector, many of those are the sector of state, of course, there are lots of decisions made around government at the time. So I think, do you want to say a little bit about this, the SAGE side? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I think there was a lot of focus and emphasis on what role did SAGE have in the decision-making process? Was it the decision-maker? Well, I think for those of us who were on SAGE, I think it was very clear that we were an advisory committee, but there was lots of narrative, both inside and outside um, of government, but particularly outside in the media, of, well, SAGE says this and the government's done this, or SAGE has decided that this is going to happen. And I think that that sort of raises a number of questions about what, you know, who is the decision maker? Well, I think I never felt that that was making decisions. I always felt I was providing advice. But that was certainly not sometimes how it was uh, how it was seen. And you could imagine that with sort of, you know, uh, things such as following the science, it could be quite am ambiguous as to, to what that, that would mean. Now, I think it was always clear that SAGE was giving advice uh, or formulating advice, but the, the whole SAGE process of coming towards a consensus from a number of opinions and then uh, putting that forward so that that could be considered is quite, uh, you know, is quite a difficult process. And I think it's even more difficult when you've got to think that science advice by its very nature is something that is, tends to be quite technical. And trying to understand how to best get that technicality across in a fair and balanced way is actually not, you know, it's not a trivial process. I think it, it really has to be recognized that you know, trying to explain a very technical argument, I mean, for lawyers explaining a technical legal argument, for a statistician explaining a technical statistical model, has to be, to someone who has very little to no background in statistics, really has to uh, be done in a way that you can sort of be comfortable that you are getting a balanced opinion when people can actually make an informed decision on that, rather than just have to assume that what you're saying is true. So that was a, one of the big things that needed to be done as part of the advice, but that could also then give this perception of who is the decision maker. There's also, of course, the role of the fact that SAGE was a committee that was um, had participation from people from both inside and outside government. There were other mechanisms put into place, such as the Joint Biosecurity Centre, where that was much more focused on bringing it in-house into government. We've got, we now see uh, the UK um, HSA, the Health Security Agency, whereas that's more about trying to really sort of bring in some of the decision, the, the um, uh, expertise um, around the advice mechanisms within government, as opposed to necessarily only relying on one central committee that obviously cannot be able to advise on absolutely everything that the government needs to understand. Um, just, and just on the last point, um, I mean, you've talked about the following science. I think something around relevant, irrelevant considerations, as, you know, as public lawyers, this, you know, this is really, really important and really key. Um, you know, science advice, one of those relevant considerations, obviously a lot of other factors. But politically, I mean, the challenge for us as government lawyers is making sure ministers stick to what are proper and appropriate considerations. Of course, there's politics in it, and there are constituencies, and there are special interests. But in deciding, you know, particularly, for example, as we were starting to unlock, what exceptions, what, what activities you do, what activities you couldn't do, you know, making sure they were consistent, making sure they were rational decisions, and weren't just based on the last conversation somebody had. But th those are really, really challenging issues. So I think making sure um, those considerations are appropriate, as well as the scientific advice. I think the other, the other area where, for example, on the travel bans, see the diplomatic considerations, there's a science on um, you know, where the rate most affection is, but there's international relations. So how, you know, how do you take those into account in an appropriate and lawful way in, in forming an agency policy? So those are certainly things which we all considered with. Um, do you want to, yeah, so it's yeah, uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I mean, one of the biggest <coughs> things, and particularly where there's potentially a slight um, difference between the legal side and the science side, is that one of the biggest jobs I had to try and convey when talking about the science was the uncertainty around it. That there was no right and wrong answer. Most of the things that were done around COVID was based on models. Those models had uncertainties built into them. Different models gave different results. And therefore trying to come up with a consensus, but then that consensus also around how certain we were of what was going to happen is one of the biggest parts of science advice. And also it moves on. 
you get more data that changes what you believe that changes the certainty around what you, th what you think it can make it more uncertain it can make it less it can make it uh, more certain so i think there's a very sort of big part of trying to explain in the scientific advice around what happens around how certain you are or uncertain you are of a particular uh, course of action will lead to a particular result whereas i think that's quite different uh, to the legal side um yeah i'm conscious of time so perhaps move on but i suppose you know when it comes to drafting that certainty point there's yeah the, the advice is essentially changing you have to fix on a legal position but the challenges on the legal side were you know legislation coming into force very late so you know 30 minutes being signed 30 minutes before, before it comes into force with criminal offenses i mean that, you know that's not ideal um you know identifying articulating behavior uh in such a broad way, which is going to be legally illegal, which is going to be, have criminal penalties, those sorts of things are, are really challenging. And as I mentioned, this the whole question of um, guidance uh, and comms and legal obligations. The lockdowns were initially announced as a, you must stay at home. The legislation was implemented four days later, actually. So that you know, that was that, that wasn't a legal position. That was well, that was that was advice. That was a requirement. You know, a political requirement, not a legal requirement. So that you know. One of the challenges for us throughout is making sure we're clear which is uh, which is guidance, which is legal obligations. We've touched a little bit on the administrative structures, and I'm not sure we need to really dwell on that. Other than to sort of say that I think, as John has alluded to, what was an emergency situation became long-term BAU, and so those sort of emergency processes and procedures for running a short-term crisis really extended, and and that caused a challenge to how you're running government and how you're doing legislation. Over, over such a sustained period of time. Um, do you want any of that? So, I mean, I think the last place, of course, where science and the law is going to, to, to come together quite starkly is we're already starting to see inquiries uh, beginning. This is the uh, um, uh, Health and Social Care and Science and Technology Committee on uh, Lessons Learned for Coronavirus, uh, but we'll see the public inquiry uh, sometime in the, in the new year. And I think now, Will be a, again a, a, a scrutiny of how did legal obligations scientific advice come together and in a very legal construct i think that's going to be something quite interesting uh, from both science and a law point of view i think one thing i wanted to quickly say was and i hope you've got this uh, from what we've said is that the government science wasn't missing during uh, the pandemic in actual fact there was a lot of government science going on it wasn't all just one set of uh, people who were external giving advice in, and that was what the government was doing. The natural fact, lots of science was going on in government departments. And vice versa, I don't think that science has become a technocracy. I don't think that scientists said this, government did that. You know, that was that was not, it wasn't, it wasn't a technocracy in that, in that way, shape or form. And I think that in actual fact, most people seem to think that, you know, there was a few important scientists who were being uh, heard and that that was all going in at the predominant the political level i think that's not i think there was a lot of science coming in from inside government departments going in to make political uh, decision making um and i think on um uh, the sort of last point i'll over to peter for the legislation point that the media does affect perceptions of advice i think having a set of internal narratives about what this advice means and having an external narrative from the media about what that same advice means sometimes with a particular agenda against it, whereas the internal advice has to follow a very set set of structures and set processes and can actually make the advice more difficult to, to give. The, the last point there is one I've sort of made already really about the difference between primary and secondary legislation. And essentially most of the legislation we're talking about was made by sections of state um, without prior uh, political scrutiny. Obviously there's a question again, the constitution was raised about the level of scrutiny of these sorts of, sort of legislation. But I think there's a perception that sort of parliament makes and scrutinize all this legislation in practice pace and the nature of legislation means that isn't always the case um so over to Leah. thank you for those i didn't uh, properly introduce dr trueblood who is a member of the oxford law faculty um a fellow at worcester college oxford and teaches constitutional and admin law so there what did you make of that Hi, thanks so much, Richard, and thank you so much to John and Peter for a terrific presentation. Um, I'm so happy to be here to discuss a topic of no contemporary relevance whatsoever. Um, and of course, to discuss two very different kinds of advice. 
One is expensive, objective, and cold, and the other is legal advice. Um, I couldn't decide which way to tell that was funny or who'd be more, or who'd be more offended. And I uh, decided I would offend my own people, the lawyers. I thought that would be, I thought that would be funnier. So I really think today is really important and I really commend Richard and Brian for organizing it and Peter and John for their collaboration. I also wanna thank them for their terrific work in government. It's really easy for people like me, for academics to criticize or to ask, you know, what could have been done better or differently, but we weren't in the, in the thick of it under some incredibly demanding uh, circumstances. So I'm just just so grateful to them uh, for their for their service in government. So I just wanted to say something quickly or take the opportunity of having two such terrific specialists together to ask about a potential asymmetry that might exist in these two different kinds of advice and then to say something as as Peter rightly says about three different trends in constitutional law and how they might help us think about how to improve or what would be some challenges in, in how decision making is changing and um, some ways that decision making might be improved. So my first question I think is about, as I say, this, this asymmetry and what John was saying about uncertainty. So I wonder if, you know, I, I, I certainly see that, that John spent a lot of his time trying to communicate uncertainty to politicians, but I wonder if there's still an asymmetry, perhaps because of the literacy of people in the relative legal and scientific literacy of people in government, whether explaining methodology of different scientific practices and modeling, error bars, um, uh, different kinds of approaches, whether we have a focus in, in law work, um, someone like Peter is giving advice on the form, but also the content, the legislative process, legal tests, but also the substance of, of what the law says on a particular question. And I wonder if there's an, as an asymmetry that, that it's, it's much, much harder for John to explain the form as well as the content and whether that creates problems. And this just gives us maybe the fun opportunity to imagine what a government would be like populated by more scientists rather than <laughs> lawyers, what that parallel world would look like in terms of giving advice. So the three trends in constitutional law I just wanted to mention. The first, as it as Peter rightly says, you know, we know in the best of times in this country, it's an extremely centralized legal and political decision making process. And we know from around the world that that's even worse in emergencies, that power tends to be consolidated in the executive. And something the COVID Review Observatory at the University of Birmingham have really stressed is that this was a, a challenge to parliamentary political accountability was that there wasn't scientific advice wasn't always available, not always available at pace to MPs, to people who wanted to hold the government to account, and of course, complicated by hybrid parliamentary sitting. So I wonder if they could reflect or have any views about the challenge of making information available, particularly to the opposition, to all MPs, but particularly to the, to the opposition. And I think information as a source of power imbalance is a big problem we have across constitutional law in general that I'm curious to hear their thoughts about. Uh, something else that I was interested in is something that the constitutional, the House of Commons Constitutional Affairs and Public Administration Committee have asked is if whether there should be some recognition in the ministerial code of um, misrepresentation of statistics or of information or misrepresentation of scientific advice, whether that should be enshrined. And that's an alternative way we've thought about constitutional lawyers sometimes think about accountability. And I just wondered what John and Peter thought about that kind of trend and particularly around the misrepresentation potentially of, of scientific advice. And the third uh, trend we have in constitutional is towards transparency, freedom of information, these kinds of uh, questions. And I guess, I wonder, you know, it depends on the issue. Of course, national security is different, but what kinds of tests or reasons it might be appropriate not to make scientific advice available to the public? And the reason I ask that is this really matters, for example, in judicial review, it really matters that the government can show we took, or a minister can show we took a range of you know, considerations into account. We considered, um, we were open to alternative points of view. Um, and so I think it's, yeah, I'm just curious to hear what kinds of reasons we might not think all modeling, you know, this is the modeling on which public power is being exercised, but we don't think it should be available to the public. Um, what kinds of reasons that John and Peter thought were good reasons. But mainly, I'm just so happy to discuss this issue of, of such importance with uh, Richard and Brian and all of you and, and everyone um, on Zoom. And I, I just want to stress again that I'm really grateful to uh, Peter and John for their expertise and their service. Thanks so much. <laughs>